Okay. Not a hire. We're not making a movie here. So once again, I stand in your way of a break. I don't know why I get to be the person that stops you from having a break. So hopefully we'll be able to go through this presentation in a, a very expeditious fashion so we can get to the break, which is the most important part of the day. So this morning you heard about the ISO standard, which is probably kind of a, the word standard is kind of a misnomer. It's, it's a guide, right? It's a recommendation for those organizations that want to meet the certification uh, of an ISO uh, facility. Many of the nuclear plants in the United States do not pursue the ISO stamp because it's very expensive to get that stamp and maintain all those systems and all the oversight. But many of them follow the processes of ISO uh, through other sort of guidance documents from IAEA, WANO, and MPO. So the rest of today, including my presentation and my colleagues who will come behind me, are going to be more tactically based about processes that address the overall uh, concept of knowledge management. Knowledge management is not one, two, or three different things. It's a combination of, of, um, of people, programs, and processes. I mean, people, programs, and technology. Remember that one slide I showed you? You know, what are the people programs that you use to manage your knowledge? What are the processes you have in place? And what technologies are you using? So you're going to hear today a lot of people uh, conversation. And so you're going to say, well, how does that relate to knowledge management? Well, this presentation about talent management is without people, knowledge management doesn't exist effectively well, right? Not until we're all machines and computers and humans no longer exist and the class is not here and we have computers running the world. That's supposed to be a joke. You all remember that movie, right, with Arnold Schwarzenegger, you know, and the robot chip in the head, right? You know, what was that one? Terminator, right? We may be approaching that pretty soon, right? <laughs> Scary thought. So, Anyway, I just want to make sure you, you understand the stage for the rest of the day. So we're going to be talking about processes at this point, you know, things that you need to have in place to have an effective knowledge management approach and strategy. Now, as you're working on your, your projects, right, each of you have different projects you're working on, you want to use today and tomorrow to some extent to help you understand what tools what approaches, what solutions we want to look at in order to properly address our project. So think of today and tomorrow and a little bit of yesterday as feeder information into your projects, okay? So that's the most important piece. And then, and then as you are, if you're in the process of putting a knowledge management program together, then one of the things you want to be thinking about is your talent management programs, your succession planning programs, how you're going to measure it through KPIs. And you're going to see examples of that throughout the day uh, between myself and my colleagues. The rest of us today presenting are practitioners. Right? We've done this in some form or fashion throughout our career. So today we'll talk about talent management. We'll talk about pipeline programs and what they might include. And this is a typical pipeline program that is that uh, U.S. Uh, and NPP and U.S. we might have. They have a summer uh, college internship program. They have an auxiliary operator development program. They'll have a reactor operator training program and maintenance uh, internship programs, an engineering development program, and, and an RP and chemistry uh, development program. These are examples of pipeline programs. These. When we talk about managing knowledge, we talk about managing cost as well. These are expensive programs. And so you want to make sure you get the right talent in these programs. You have them well defined. You have an objective and what you're trying to achieve, what your output of these programs might be on the getting the results that you expect. And so we think about timing, right? And I mentioned yesterday, 
Now, some organizations are reaching back into their high schools, right, to start to attract talent for the future. So we talked about more, uh, more than once, Andre and others have talked about multiple generations. These plants will last somewhere between 60 to 100 years, right? So if you think about it, some of the plants that are being constructed today in the other parts of the world, not in the US, but China, Abu Dhabi, and other parts of the world, those plants will run 100 years, almost for certain. The older plants that were constructed in the 70s may not run quite 100 years, and maybe it'll be 60 years. But how many generations out is that, right? Just start thinking generationally here. And so if I'm going to need talent 10 years from now, in my organization, and I've thought, remember that presentation, I said you gotta look at your workforce analytics, think out who am I, how many people are gonna need five years out, three years out, eight years out, 10 years out, because you know, mother nature always wins. Let's just face it. We will all go with the winds with mother nature. That's just the way it is. And so I have to plan so I can maintain my knowledge and maintain my competency. So think about it. If I need talent now, there are currently people in adult programs, right? But if I need talent 10 years from now, I'm talking about grade schoolers. So if, I wanna, if, I, if I'm thinking that my technology is changing and my skills are changing, I want to recruit, and I go down to my local preschool, my local grade school, I see those little kids running around, teasing each other, pulling each other's hair, those are my next workers. Now, you don't think that's scary? And most of those people have phones. They don't even, they don't even talk anymore. They text each other. I don't even get all of that stuff half the time. I mean, what happened to a conversation? Nobody talks on the phone anymore. So, think about that. We're talking about reaching out, you know, ready in three to five years or in grades nine through 11. And if I need them six to 10 years from now, those, those people are in grades four through eight. So when you're thinking about your understanding your balance, like particularly those countries that are developing countries, you have to have the infrastructure in place and the education system to support the pipeline for talent for the future. And so, so when we talk about what the World Bank does, the World Bank helps us to make sure that we have the right educational institutions in place so we can have sustainable knowledge and sustainable technologies for the future. And they're talking about, this is why they're talking about building good high schools and grade schools and, and colleges, right? They're thinking out that far out. So anyway, if you're a developing nation, how have you thought this out? If you're an existing power plant or existing organization, what are you doing to, to make sure you have a balance between uh, the supply and demand for, for talent in the industry. So the, um, the nuclear industry a few years ago came together and developed an industry competency model. So what does it take to be an effective uh, nuclear worker? These are knowledge workers. And um, they developed uh, based off already industry standards of, of education. Um, uh, personal effectiveness competencies, academic requirements, and workplace requirements. These were the basic sort of national career readiness certificates. And then they linked them to the, to the energy sector. So notice on the academics, mathematics, engineering technology, and critical thinking, those are STEM type of skills, right? And so that's why STEM is important, science, technology, engineering, and math. That's basic foundational knowledge. Um, but look at the personal effectiveness one. One of the things that we've noticed uh, with the young generation coming in is they communicate and they interact differently. Um, we've also noticed a great deal of struggling with writing. Um, and uh, uh, the ability to kind of listen effectively well, right? The attention stands are shorter. They don't write effectively well. They don't even write plain English anymore, right? OMG, what the heck is that? <laughs> but think about that, though. We have, we have acronyms in our industry. Depends if you're, on the, if you're a regulator, or if you're R&D, or if you're uh, an operator. But 
that doesn't translate effectively well to the English that's now and the slang that's used in today's schools and education. So how do we bridge that? And as knowledge management champions, we have to be thinking about that impact, right? Of how that generation is learning and developing today. What sort of foundational skills are they getting? And the next thing on the higher up, we talk about the specific sort of technical um, uh, 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 fundamentals in terms of for the energy sector, right? Um, this is more kind of safety and, and pr industry principles and, and quality control principles. And then finally, we've got the two-year degree, which is very specific to the technical skills the individual have in, in operations or radiation protection or engineering technicians. But the point that I'm trying to get to is that there's a standard competency model that the United States industry has adopted. And quite frankly, I think it's adopted by a number of other international organizations as well based on these sort of standards. And if you're working with your community colleges already, these are some things that are readily available or public domain. So we're back to workforce planning. And the reason why I bring this to you is I wanted to show you an example. And this, the, the pointer doesn't work. So so much for good technology. But this is a company, Entergy Corporation in the United States. And this is how they compare to the their, their workforce aging years to the industry. I'm going to show you a graph either later on today or tomorrow that has a kind of reflection of that. So we are an aging industry. Um, and because of that, we are challenged as an industry to make sure that we have the right tile and pipelines coming in so we have knowledge, uh, maintain knowledge preservation. And so we have to have our pipeline programs. And one of the things you have to have in a pipeline program is to make sure you have the right sort of mix of pipeline programs. So this is just an illustration, but if you don't have a pipeline program into your organization, you won't be successful because you can't find the talent that you're going to need with already the requisite skills you're going to have to have. You have to develop that internally. They don't teach it in school. They'll teach the basic fundamental competencies but Rosa Tom, EDF, U.S. Industries, they all have development pipeline programs. And if you're new to this particular, if you're a newcomer, you have to think about what will my pipeline program be for my regulators? What will my pipeline program be for my R&D? Then now we're going to get into talent management um, and, and developing talent and improving performance. And so this is a whole sort of um, discipline in and above itself and we're not going to go through it in so much detail that you guys are going to die on me but it's about a cycle a life cycle employee life cycles every year right how do you develop your employees how do you identify those that you want to um, uh, uh, promote and develop and and the schedule of rewarding and results and and so this is a model that a US industry uses for developing and improving talent it's an ongoing sort of process where you set goals, you measure against goals, and then you can provide feedback. I give this to you as illustration purposes. But I notice I linked it to the CO 6.3. That's the, that is the performance and objectives criteria for human resources. Hello. Okay, there we go. Goes like this. It goes back and forth. All right. I think we have battery challenges today, aren't we? <laughs> so 6.3 is the performance objectives criteria for human resources that addresses talent performance management and that you have to have these programs in place. And I wanted to at least make sure you understood that linkage. But this is what's really important about, our, about what, we, what I want to talk about, talent management. And we'll go through some, some things a little bit more. But You've got to have kind of a strategy or methodology to measure ability, desire, and commitment you know, to a particular organization. And HIPO, HIPO, is, is a high potential uh, program. Um, and you have to have some sort of strategy to monitor it, how you're developing and you're tracking your results. And a lot of companies in the United States, a lot of utilities are starting to use people health committees to kind of review and follow that sort of process. So I should give this to you as illustration. Once again, I want to re reiterate the Palavri hiring model because this is really so important. Their strategy is to develop 
people from, from within, from, from the engineering operations and maintenance pipelines, you know, through the employee life cycle. And these arrows are people who leave the organization through different parts of their career. So what is your hiring model? What's your strategy model in your organizations? This is just an example of, of the Palo Verde model. Again, 5, 10, 15 years out, what will your organization look like? Now, why is this important? If you want to become ISO certified, you have to have this strategy in place. Knowledge management talks about that, as well as the HR uh, uh, um, criteria. It's in there. These are things you have to have. And these are just examples of them, right? These are tools you can use. Now, this is, happens to be Palo Verde's sort of future for leaders uh, and how they manage people. But um, mentoring programs, employee engagement, dynamic learning activities, job rotations, assessments. They have a leadership academy. They have uh, community involvement. Uh, they do enterprise risk management, career pathing. We're going to talk about some of those today. But one of the things I want to talk to you about is Lominger, Lominger competencies. How many have heard of Lominger competencies? It's, um, these are two professors, uh, Lombardo and Eichinger, I, I, I can't pronounce that correctly. They, uh, they came up with a book for, um, for your improvement, FYI, and they came up with, I think, 80 plus sort of competencies. And they said that we do best um, if we learn best by on-the-job experiences. And that's where we get most of our experiences. And then we have peer interactions, which account for about 20%, and then formal education is about 10%. I should have probably flipped these around and done formal first. But in the classroom, the message here is simple. In the classroom training um, gets you only 10% of the way there, guys. You can take all the people in the world, throw them in here, lecture to them like we're doing to you today, and your mind only works as long as your butt is engaged, right? Period. End of story, right? 10, 15 minutes of this, and you're done. You're ready, you're thinking, you're on the phone, you're doing something else. We get it. We know. We, I'm in your chair, too. It's that on-the-job piece that's important. And so, and it's that peer-to-peer, -peer, it's that community of practice. So why it's important to, to have lectures and have classroom training, it's most important to get them in the field and get them the experience and give them the opportunity to apply the technology that they're learning in the classroom and elsewhere. Somebody mentioned the other day distance learning. Was it one of you gentlemen mentioned it? I'm, I'm, I'm with you on that. <laughs> you, distance learning will only get you 10% of the way, maybe 20% of the way there. You've got to find a way to get those people engaged in your organization and out in the field. And I'm going to show you a video a little bit later on about interns and how interns learn and apply um, standards and expectations. But this is available. You can get the 702010 off the internet. However, to buy the FYI book, it's a couple hundred dollars. It's not cheap. That's how these consultants make their money and buy their big houses and live in Massachusetts. <laughs> We like to refer to it as tax Massachusetts in, in, in the United States because they pay very much in taxes, as you said earlier. All right, and then this is just an example of how one company, in this case Palo Verde, breaks their 2010, uh, 70 2010 down in terms of the things that, that, are, that are, uh, they use to get to that particular point. So let's talk about career ladders, right? I came from a generation that you went through the progressive sort of linear career pattern, right? You came in at the bottom, you got coffee for everybody, you did all the grunt work, you got stuck doing all the overtime, you cleaned the bathrooms, and you finally progressed up, right? That's right, that's what interns are good for, right? But what's really most effective, folks, Although we love to have our grunts, and me included, it's, it's the lattice sort of pathways. It's the, it's the non-traditional methods. It's horizontal learning where you're getting experiences in multiple organizations. And so as you are thinking about putting in an internship program or a development program in your organization, don't think of it hierarchical. Think of it horizontally. How do you give 
those op students of the opportunity to work in multiple areas with multiple experiences. Because remember, Lomager tells us 70% of our learning is experience, experiential based, right? And so how do you give that experience? How do you move horizontally and vertically at the same time? So that's what you've got to think about. And this is just an excellent example I pulled off uh, from, a, from another particular uh, presentation. So to get to the top anymore isn't a direct straight up. It is horizontally. You may go from design engineering to mechanical engineering to operations to training to, to uh, nuclear oversight, right? There's multiple paths in an MPP. And think about that as your career. And as you're new, if you're a new particular person in the organization, right, you're new to this industry, we have a great opportunity for lattice pathways. It isn't necessarily you have to start in the bathroom, you know, cleaning the toilets like some of us did, and then move your way up. By the way, there's nothing wrong with that. That was my outage job, right? Everybody has to have an outage job. That was mine. I emptied the trash. <laughs> All right, 10 steps process for succession planning. I'm not going to go through this in a lot of detail uh, because you can read this stuff on the internet. But here's the most important part. You have to have some way of evaluating people. I'm going to go through kind of a nine block um, process so you can kind of see how that works. And then you have to have a way to kind of hierarchically create your planned roles for readiness levels. You know, and we break, typically we break them down in the industry between ready now for the next level, ready to one to two years, ready three to five years, and an interim candidate, you know, while you're um, somebody to fill in the role. So this is a standard nine box. Um, I, I, maybe one of these gentlemen can help me out, but I think this came out of GE, right, back in the day? I think GE came up with the nine box. I can't remember who came up with the nine box. I want to say General Electric, but I could be wrong. But this is assessing potential assessment versus performance assessment, right? This is, this is used throughout the world in assessing people for the next readiness position. You can have great performance, but, but if you don't have the potential, the desire to move up, and so leaders, you ask leaders to evaluate talent. You say, okay, how's their performance? How's their potential for the next le uh, level? And so part of succession planning is to go through in a system, system process and evaluate people against the nine box. There's a 12 box as well, right? They're all done in groups of three. And so this is a standard sort of deliverable nine box. And why is this important and why is it part of knowledge management? Because you have to, in order to maintain knowledge preservation, you have to have leaders and individuals who are going to lead the organization who understand those sort of roles and responsibilities. And this will help you make sure you have the right type of leadership for the future. And it doesn't have to be leaders. You can also use this for technical careers as well. This just happens to be kind of the one that they, you see in the, in the leadership realm. So nine box succession planning, standard, standard stuff. Has nothing to do with the nuclear industry. You see this everywhere in the world. GE. GE? That's what I thought. Yeah, they were big about rating, rank, ranking people. General Electric, by the way, used to force out every year the bottom 10 or 20% of their workforce every year. If you weren't a high contributor performer, the bottom 10 or 12%, they always force ranked everybody. I'm not quite sure I agree with this philosophy, but they force ranked everybody, and that bottom 10% got cut. It is an expensive way to develop talent. <laughs> so this is career path methodology, and, and this is a methodology, another tool to use, in addition to the nine box, where you, I say, okay, if I'm going to be ready for this next level position, this would be, let's say, a, um, a director level position, where do I come from? Where do I get my talent pulls from? So remember, yesterday I showed you that fishbone diagram that says, you know, where do I pull my pipeline program from? This would be something similar to that. Another tool that, that you can use um, as you think about how do I get people ready for the next level? Where do they need to come from? If I'm going to, if for instance, I'll go to this one. This is a nuclear insurance director. This is oversight. And what Palo Verde said is that they ha least have to have some experiences in the blue box. That's what's required, right, based on the standards. And then the preferred career path is from engineering, maintenance, operations, and, and within the department. 
And the alternative career path is through performance improvement, regulatory affairs, and, other, and work management. Those are different paths. And these are, and then the development is down in this particular box. And they put these together, Powell already put these together in an effort in combining with the nine box in, in order to make sure that the people that are being considered for that particular position have gotten those experiences, right? Back to Lominger competencies, 70% of experiential. And so if you want to be considered, and this is great, we also use this to help people get ready for that next level. If you want to be considered to become the director of oversight, then you have to spend time in engineering, maintenance, and operations so you can get those experiences. So when you go into that role, you're ready. You've developed that knowledge base, right? Those experiences. You can't just get that from reading a book or looking at a job description. It's not going to cut it. So these are kind of career paths that you might be able to use. This is your typical succession planning illustration. This comes from one of the best known products out there called Success Factors. It's a tool, online tool. And this is what it looks like. It says here are the candidates, here's where their, their readiness status is, and here's their, you know, the, the successors for them. Just examples of that. This is kind of leader integration and development. And so if you if you want to start doing this sort of work, you've got to be thinking about, well, how do I get my people ready? How do I get my leaders ready? What are my assimilation programs for new leaders? What are my continuing education programs for leaders? Who owns these particular programs? Is it human resources? Is it the training department? What's the role of the director and the officers? And what are the external sort of initiatives they need to be part of the development? You've got to put that strategy together on how you develop your talent. This is an illustration of the Palo Verde strategy you can use to kind of help you think through that. So let's talk about the mentoring program. Um, so this is an example of the Palo Verde mentoring program. It's a two-year program. And it's designed to take frontline leaders and individual contributors who want to be emerging leaders. And this is how you go deep in an organization. Remember I showed you on the diagram that we have this kind of mid-career gap in the 40s, right? We don't have enough people in, in the 40 to 50 year range. So we have to find a way to take the 30 year olds and get them ready quicker, faster for leadership roles. Mentoring program is one method to do that. It's, uh, you're, they're nominated by the executives and the directors. Um, mentees are encouraged to, to work with their mentors, multiple mentors. They have to take accountability for the mentoring program. And I'll go through a little bit more of that later. The benefits is, is that mentoring programs gives people lower in the organization opportunity to work with people higher in the organization so they can get that experience in a much quicker way. It's back to experiential sort of learning, giving them an opportunity to shadow, be part of that, understand how those leaders work so they're ready for the next level quicker, faster, and longer term uh, retention. So in conclusions, we are in the people business. You thought we were making nuclear energy, right? You thought that we're here to regulate energy, we thought we're here to develop new energy, we thought we're here to operate a power plant. We are in the people business. Without people, until the robots take over, we're not going to get any of this done. So think about your role in knowledge management as part of the people business. Even if you're an IT exp uh, expert and you're, and you're talking about IT systems to manage documents and information, it's still about the people business, right? How people are going to interface. How are we going to devote our time to hiring selection of people? How are we going to help people be successful in the long term? So think about it. We are in the people business, not just the energy business. There you go. I got this done in a half hour. Now, they gave me 45 minutes, but I knew I'd get it done in a half hour. <laughs>